Hi there. In uh, the 2009 film Angels and Demons, uh, uh, originally a book by Dan Brown, of course, which actually grossed over $400 million uh, in, in, in sales, um, a very, very popular film. Uh, Dr. Robert Langdon, when confronted uh, by, uh, um, by the arch enemy, as it turns out, um, do you believe in God, Dr. Land Langdon? Um, and uh, Robert uh, actually replies, um, a very interesting reply. He says, um, uh, if I can remember it, he says, my, um, my mind uh, would like to believe in the existence of God. Uh, but my heart tells me that I will never received that gift of faith. Uh, so, you know, which I think is very good. His heart tells him uh, that uh, that he would not receive the gift of faith. And um, it's quite an interesting twist on the thing that, you know, that faith comes from the heart. Um, and uh, But he's sort of saying that his heart will tell him that he will never have faith even though his mind is telling him uh, that he would rather like to have uh, faith. Um, so faith is a problematic uh, thing. I think a lot of people find themselves in Robert Langdon's uh, predicament, as it were. Um, and it's a predicament which Gnosis, uh, which if you receive Gnosis or a numinous experience, um, well, that's basically uh, your your mind actually receiving uh, insight into what your heart uh, already knows. Your heart knows that God exists, um, and this is confirmed uh, by an experience which you which you are cognizant of, cognizant of, uh, which your heart knows but can't can't actually explain to you. It can't actually communicate uh, what it actually knows. So this numinous experience connects heart and mind together. Um, but if you haven't got either faith and you've never had numinous experience, uh, then what on earth have you got? Um, well, if you're anything like me, you've got a whole bunch of words. <laughs> and uh, words come easily to me, uh, you know, uh, uh, writing and, and talking. Uh, I'm, I'm better at writing down words than I am speaking them, actually. I'm, I'm more, I'm better with, uh, with pen and paper, or I used to be. Uh, when I could see properly, and now I have to do everything on the computer uh, because you've got more time to think, and I and I always feel I'm rushed uh, about what I say uh, on YouTube. Um, I don't know why, uh, but of course you can't have you know. There's no time limit on these videos anymore, but uh, there's somehow you don't want dead air either. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Um, so I have a whole bunch of words. Um, and, of course, these words get me into trouble because a lot of people say, are you sincere about these words or are you just a dilettante? Um, and I have to say, I think I veer between, between, between being sincere and insincere. Um, and perhaps it's a problem I have with Robert Langdon about my, my mind and my heart. Uh, my heart wants to believe in, in, in metaphysics and God, uh, but my mind... But my, my mind wants to believe it, but my heart is telling me uh, that, that I will not, re not receive the gift of faith um, ever, um, presumably because uh, the heart actually thinks really that at the end of the day there isn't any life after death um, or there isn't any survival uh, and God didn't make the world um, and uh, we all just came into being uh, through the operation of chance alone. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that there's nothing afterwards uh, at all. Um, so we have a lot of, lot of words which, which I talk about. I talk a good game. I talk about everything uh, confidently uh, as, as if I knew something. Uh, but really, I don't know anything. I, I don't know anything. Uh, I don't know anything more than the atheist does, actually. Um, so faith is a problem. I never had the numinous experience, the gnosis. Um, and I also don't think, as you very well know, I don't think that gnosis is something that you could dial up. <laughs> uh, you, so you can say to the universe, give me some gnosis, you know, and then I'll believe. But, you know, it doesn't work like that, I don't think. Um, you know, it doesn't sort of work like that. Well, 
some people think you see that 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 it does work like that that all you've got to do is have the right telescope or microscope a uh, psychic one and and you can look down this microscope or you can look up to the stars in your psychic telescope and uh, and and you can can dial up gnosis you can see god <laughs> staring back at you <laughs> as one of the stars or all of the stars or whatever you you've got your psychic telescope um, and you can see God, and, and, and there's God looking down at you. So, and then you say, oh, right, okay, that's God, is it? You know, uh, It all seems a bit, um, I don't like metaphysics, really. Um, metaphysics uh, is supposed to come from the, from the idea that, uh, of something before physics. Uh, so something, the causality of physics is metaphysics. Um, and this is the same, actually, in... Um, <clears throat> Uh, in in uh, in Hinduism uh, about circulating prana uh, through pranayama uh, or breath control, uh, and prana means before breath. <clears throat> um, so the idea you see is that there is a metaphysical uh, element to prana. Uh, so the pra is before, and the na means breath. Um, and so before you have physical breath, you have this. Uh, psychic or ethereal or etheric template of breath onto which uh, breath uh, is attached or from which breath grows. Uh, so prana is the seed uh, and, and na, which means breath, uh, is the plant that grows from the seed, you see. Um, and so you have this thing called metaphysics, uh, which is the seed of the physical universe from which the physical universe grows like a plant, you see. Um, and uh, if one believed that, uh, or had evidence for that, um, and that sort of actually refers to Neoplatonism and, their, and Plato's idea of forms, uh, and realm of forms, you see that things, everything like cold and, and heat and cold and heat uh, have a sort of metaphysical template, uh, which is the seed of these uh, physical phenomena. Uh, from which the physical phenomena grow or come into being or manifest. So first you have the realm of ideas and then you have the forms of ideas and those forms of ideas um, uh, create or manifest uh, the actual uh, physical or mental phenomena. Um, so you'd have a form of fear, you'd have a form of creativity, you'd have a form of love, etc, etc, as well as forms for everything that exists, every every molecule, every atom in the universe has its metaphysical form uh, from which that molecule, that atom, uh, grows, you see. So this is the quaint idea of, me of metaphysics. Um, but as I say, it seems to me that if you have never experienced these metaphysical forms, as it were, uh, as part of a numinous experience and you, and you don't have faith that they just exist, uh, then what you have is a lot of words, uh, as I said before. Um, and but what? You, but the fourth estate, uh, which which is something which grows out of it, is that what you have from these words is meaning. Okay, um, and this is a bit of a tricky uh, a tricky concept to get one's head around um, because uh, the words have meaning. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, as Wittgenstein said, the uh, words are like sort of signposts, really. They, they signpost us towards some kind of uh, referent. Um, so, you know, the word apple uh, kind of signposts us to a, a thing which has been defined in such a way as to give rise to the word, you see. Um, so uh, the words that, that, that people talk about, you know, God and, and soul and soul awareness and, and demiurge and, and, and all the Gnostic terminology that springs to mind, um, these, uh, these words are either veri verified uh, directly through Gnosis uh, or, or, you, or you could uh, develop uh, faith uh, in, in these words. Um, which is inadequate as far as Gnosticism is concerned, because what you really want uh, is a direct experience and not faith uh, that something exists because you've been told uh, that you ought to have faith. Um, if you want to be a good American, uh, then you ought to have faith in Jesus. Uh, that's, not, that's not what... Uh, well, actually, that's not what faith is, uh, and it's certainly not what Gnosis is, you see. Uh, that's a kind of sort of... Um, a kind of conditional love, you know, you either believe in Jesus uh, or you're not part of us, 
sort of thing, you see, uh, which is, that's external religion, but it's nothing to do with mysticism on which religion is based. Um, so anyway, I return to all my words, you see, uh, and these words that I'm spouting on now, uh, and uh, if, if there's no faith attached to these words, or faith in these words, and there's no numinous experience as yet uh, to confirm these words, then you just have a lot of words. Um, but you also do have meaning. Uh, and this is something that Stefan Heuler uh, talks a lot about in his homilies and talks. He talks about meaning um, in the Jungian sense of the word, sort of in what he calls depth psychology, uh, which presumably means that uh, uh, that the words uh, that we that we that we utter about Gnosticism. Uh, which perhaps have yet to be confirmed through Gnosis and which are transcendent of faith. Uh, we don't need faith for these words to, to live. Um, and we don't even need the numinous experience because uh, these words themselves uh, have, have meaning, have direct meaning, uh, in the sense that they have value. Um, so it's not just about definition of an apple, for example. Uh, it's about the value of the word apple because, you know, it can actually, well, we have a picture of an apple, or we think it's rather tasty, so we have a, a, a memory uh, of the sweet taste of an apple, for example. Um, so the apple has a value, and of course it has vitamin C, and it, you know it's good for us to eat apples, right? Um, so in a sense, it's good for us. Uh, it's good for us to, to have words like God, and soul, and soul awareness, and, uh, and even bija mantras like Hugh. Uh, which are supposed to uh, connect us to God in an intimate way uh, through the mantra. Um, it's it's a good it's a good it, these words have value. Uh, they have meaning. Uh, well, the, the value ex extends or, or or arises from the meaning of these words. Um, and uh, you know we 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 have a sort of picture in our mind uh, of a supreme personality, for example, of God. Um, or we have a sort of impersonal Brahmin sort of universal principle uh, sort of written high in gold letters on the universe as it were and we have a picture of this every time somebody says God or soul or soul awareness um, and, and this can bring us psychological uh, I would psychological comfort I suppose yes um, but not not really because as, as Grayling talks about you know he says well you know, religion, religion is supposed to comfort people, but what comfort is there in a lie? <laughs> because he's an atheist, so he says, you know, you know, why believe in God? Why, why, the, why, the, why is God such a comforting thought when there is no God? It doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> it, it's, it's a lie that God exists, uh, and therefore you shouldn't derive comfort from being lied to. <laughs> uh, you know, get, get with the program, get real about this. Um, but I think... Um, that meaning goes beyond this because I was thinking, you know, the existence of God and the existence of soul is very much bound up with our uh, with our desire for self preservation. Um, you know, in the nineteenth century, they wanted science to prove the existence of soul and life after death um, because nobody likes the idea of being dead. You see, um, and uh, so you know, thinking about one's self preservation, one's instinct to survive. You've got this idea that there is a God that's going to pluck you out of the of the hands of death um, and extinction and and reassemble you um, in a way that uh, that makes your consciousness as you are now live forever, <laughs> um, which is I suppose the basis of of, of resurrection, uh, bodily resurrection, as in Orthodox Christianity. Um, so. Any meaning that you derive from words like God and Gnosis and, and soul, um, they've actually got to transcend even this desire to go on living, <laughs> this desire for self-preservation, this instinct to survive, which is an animal instinct. Um, so basically you've got to sort of get rid of this instinct to survive. Um, this animal instinct to, to go on, as it were, uh, because the meaning that you've got that you should contemplate from words like God and soul um, have nothing to do with your survival after death, actually. Um, 
And uh, if they have, then, then, then you're not being transcendental enough, really. Uh, so transcendentalism is actually when you let go of your animal instinct to survive uh, and you let go of your consciousness as it's presently, uh, uh, presently made up of, um, which is basically, you know, what's in it for me, <laughs> you know, love, luck and loot for me uh, and survival for me. Uh, or for my loved ones, which are an extension of me, after all. No, you've got to let go of all that. Um, let go of, of your own self-survival, uh, survival of loved ones, uh, you, know, you know, granny's gone to a, a nicer place and all this kind of stuff. You've got to let go of all that um, and, and really, really have a transcendental experience, uh, which... which Basically, you'd come back from if it was done in this life, and you'd never remember it. Uh, it would be something like a, like a, well, not even like a dream, really, or a reverie. There would be nothing left uh, of your, of your sort of, of your consciousness as it's, as it's currently, um, currently uh, made up of. Uh, you would just simply come back, you, you would simply, uh, well, you wouldn't remember it. <laughs> um, and you might sort of think, well, then what's the use of God and soul if there's nothing in it for me? <laughs> yeah. uh, if there's nothing in it to gratify my sense of, of self-preservation and instinct to survive, then what the, what the hell's the point of it, really? Um, and uh, so deriving meaning uh, from all these words... Um, is, I suppose, a moot point if the meaning of the words is not actually backed up by some sort of numinous Gnostic experience. Um, but, of course, until you've had that Gnostic numinous experience, all you have got, basically, is faith. Um, and I don't think that faith is necessarily a block. Uh, it's not going to block you from the numinous experience di directly, because you know, your heart uh, is going to love God and your, your head is going to assume that God exists uh, in, some, in, in some form of existence, in some meaning of the word exists, you know. Um, and, and that's probably going to be okay uh, as far as it goes. Uh, but of course, you know, you may be, you know, in church and you may have got your faith and you may be assuming God's existence. Um, and who knows, you may have a Gnostic numinous experience uh, which actually confirms uh, the fact uh, that your faith is justified. Uh, and then from this experience, this direct experience, then the words that you're hearing from the pulpit uh, will actually mean something because it will refer, in fact, to a real thing, just as, it, just as the word apple refers to a real apple, uh, ultimately. Uh, I mean, okay, imagined apple and all this, but it, it refers to somewhere in the universe there is a thing that really is an apple, <laughs> and that word apple refers to it. So your Gnostic experience will refer you to somewhere that to to the to the word God, that somewhere in the universe there is this thing called God, um, which has been confirmed by your direct experience. Uh, but until then, all you do have is a lot of words. Which, presume, which do bring a sort of comfort, uh, but it's a comfort that transcends your animal instinct to survive, um, uh, mixed up with a lot of faith uh, that you don't really need a Gnostic experience, a numinous experience. You're quite happy uh, to follow your heart, which tells you that God exists uh, and your mind just has to get on with it. It just has to you know, play along, as it were, uh, with your heart. Um, and, uh, you know... And, that, and that's it. Well, of course, I mean, this, exp this whole discussion is incredibly uh, complicated and it's taken much greater minds than mine, many, many centuries to debate and think about and contemplate. Um, so I don't pretend that in this video I've, I've gotten to the answer. Um, I would say that, you know, as you say, you have four things. You have faith and you have the numinous experience and you have words. Uh, and you have meaning of those words, which refer back to something uh, that your numinous experience uh, ha has referred to, such as God or soul or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, these four, four components uh, and the dynamic equilibrium or the energy that flows from these components, uh, which is, you know, faith, numinous experience, meaning uh, and words, they all sort of coalesce together. 
to create a thing called Gnosticism, which as somebody reminded me is a sort of portable um, a portable contemplation almost that you you know uh, you carry this contemplation around every day. Uh, you know you hear the words like soul um, and you derive meaning from them and you have faith uh, that one day uh, you know this there would the words will be confirmed that they will be referring to something as real as an apple uh, for example uh, and then of course the old chestnut people will come back to me and say well the apple doesn't really exist at all either you know uh, it's just just photons and, and and quantum quantum waves on a quantum ocean um, uh, 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 but uh, you know it's just eddies and the quantum the quantum uh, continuum uh, and that may be true, of course, as well. Um, and, and if that's true, then, then certainly, you know, the fact that uh, that I will not survive death uh, as I am now, as I'm making this video, and I'm sort of, you know, conscious of myself. If I won't survive that after death, uh, as I didn't have it before I was born, uh, apparently. Um, although some people say, what about reincarnation and all that, um, and, and memories of being being different people at different times of history. Um, I don't know about that. Um, you know, I, that would seem to me to smack of 19th century quasi-science uh, coming in to confirm that, that, confirm that you do definitely survive death in some form or another. Um, and that would almost seem to me to be well, certainly anti-faith, um, and and possibly meaningless as well, because you know you're you're trying to you're trying to prove something metaphysical with the physical laws of physics, <laughs> as it were, uh, which I don't think makes much sense, really. Um, but in my mind, I suppose these these categories of of meaning words, faith, and and a numinous experience and gnostic experience. Uh, I mean, perhaps they're being, you know, treated separately when, when really that, that isn't the idea at all and they should be treated as a unity. Uh, but that unity would certainly be beyond my, my brain to conceive of. Uh, I certainly wouldn't even know what that unity would look like or what it would feel like or what it would, um, uh, how it would be detected by my, uh, by my physical senses or my mind. Uh, explored with my mental faculties um, and so we do go back to something which is indefinable and unconceivable again which is the, which is the unity of meaning words faith and and a numinous experience um, they all come together in the center somewhere uh, it, it, and that center is really really completely beyond my capacity to even ex describe to you uh, or even categorize or, or have any formula uh, to explain uh, with, you know. Um, and uh, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that uh, that Gnostics mull over, um, you know, and at the end of the day, Christian fundamentalists will say, what a load of poppycock and what a load of nonsense, you know, come down to our church and wave your Bible in the air and, and sing, uh, I love Jesus. And uh, and, and you won't have to worry about any of this stuff at all. You'll just be one of us. Uh, you'll be a good American. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll be a good Republican and, and all will be well. <laughs> um, but uh, the funny thing is, though, that in this world, it doesn't seem that that is actually adequate, in fact, to be one of us uh, and waving your Bible on the, in, in, the, in the wind because the wind doesn't seem to care about your Bible waving activities. Uh, it, it'll just knock you down anyway. Uh, and in the face of that, uh, people will say, oh, you have bad faith, uh, so you're being rather naughty. Um, but, you know, Gnostics can't help being naughty, I suppose. You know, we are, we are kind of rebellious against this whole thing of just, you know, put up with uh, things as they are, put up with thoughts as they are. Uh, we always want to push things further um, until we come to a kind of dead end, which I have done in this video. Uh, and we can't go any further, uh, and then we have this idea that some someday uh, we're either going to leap over the wall uh, or be carried over the wall by by some angel with golden wings, uh, and on the other side of the wall um, everything will become clear, um, and we will go clear, 
uh, and we will have clear and distinct ideas about God's existence, to put it in a Cartesian way. Um, so we even put, we even bring Bob Descartes into this, really. Uh, no one likes Descartes anymore, do they? Uh, they didn't like him when he was in the 17th century, they didn't like him. So, um, you know, although there are Cartesian philosophers around, so he's not, uh, Cartesianism is not actually dead and buried at the, uh, you know, at this time even. Um, and who knows, make, make, make a comeback. Uh, because, you know, the thing about Descartes is, uh, you know, clear and distinct ideas. Really, he's referring to meditation. He is referring uh, to the Gnostic experience. Uh, but that's uh, a video for another day.